Thanks for having me, everybody. I'm excited to tell you a little bit about what we're building at Vicarious. Um, uh, so we are supported by some of my personal heroes and, and about $120 million from some great venture funds and some big corporates. And uh, I think the best way to understand what it is that we're building and why is this really bizarre paradox of modern life, uh, which is that we live in a world where all the parts of robots, motors and sensors, plastics, electricity, are all really affordable and nobody owns any robots. You know, if you go to a, a factory in the 1900s or a retail store or a hospital and you go to one of those places today, basically nothing changes. And we pay humans billions of dollars a year to pick up things in one box and put them in a different box. And then we pay them hundreds of billions a year to take things out of boxes and put them on shelves. And then we pay them trillions of dollars a year to take things out of little bins and put them on other things. And the list goes on and on and on. And I don't know about you, but this is really, really far from the future that I thought I was going to be living in when I was a 10-year-old. I thought we would have general purpose robots that could do all kinds of different things. And the truth is, from a hardware perspective, we do have general purpose robots that can do all kinds of different things. This is basically Rosie the robot. The trick of the video here is the robot is being controlled by a human. So as long as you have a human brain in the loop, you can do basically anything you want with robot parts. Like if I forced you to live your everyday life using a normal robot gripper, I think that you could live your everyday life. Um, and so... Functionally, we actually already live in the Jetson society. We just lack the software layer, the AI layer necessary to make robots ubiquitous and useful. Uh, and that's what Vicarious has been working on for all this time and with all that money. Um, I think of it like Intel Inside for Robots, where it's just one AI platform uh, that takes any combination of arms and grippers and sensors and tasks and just works. Um, I think that uh, every interesting startup exists to make a prediction about the future come true. Uh, and the prediction that I'd really like Vicarious to make come true is 15 years from now, I want there to be more robots and cell phones. I want robots to be as commonplace as the devices that are in all of our pockets. And I think to get there, since this is a conference about artificial general intelligence, I think we can actually draw some really interesting lessons from the evolution of biological intelligence, animal intelligence, the original AI. Um, so if we go back 600 million years, uh, you see the very first intelligence emerge. Uh, things like sponges and jellyfish and flatworms. And then as time passes, um, the animals get more complicated. I would argue they don't get any smarter. Uh, it's just deeper nesting of simple behaviors uh, and heuristics. And in the neuroscience world, we call this the old brain. It's all about stimulus and response. It's about instinct. Uh, and then about 100 million years ago, a miracle happened, and evolution figured out this radically different architecture for intelligence. That's what gave rise to primates and whales and dolphins and, and you and me. Um, and in the neuroscience world, we call this the new brain. And it's all about causal reasoning uh, and uh, mental simulation uh, and why and what if. Uh, and uh, I'm going to argue today that most of the work on deep learning right now, as amazing as it is, is focused in this yellow box. There's a little bit that's outside of it, but I think to get to that future of billions of robots, we really need to shift architectures. And I'll explain what I mean. So, the old brain and deep learning are both really awesome. Like, you can do all kinds of stuff with an old brain system. Uh, you can hunt for food, you can navigate environments, you can reproduce. Um, but old brain animals have some really important limitations. Uh, namely, it takes a couple hundred million years of training data to make an old brain animal. Um, and then the resulting animal or insect has very low generalization to new tasks uh, and new behaviors. And most importantly, it's just giving you the illusion of intelligence without actually having a deep understanding of what it's doing or why. It doesn't really have a model of the world. Uh, and it has this kind of architecture, which will look remarkably similar if you read NIPS papers. Um, so uh, because it's operating on stimulus response, it can go wrong in a bunch of ways that are kind of funny and are very analogous to the ways that modern deep learning systems can go wrong. Uh, these are baby geese. Uh, baby geese will make this noise. And scientists found that mother geese will actually love and care for anything that makes that sound. So you can take a tape recorder that plays that noise and put it inside a taxidermy of a wolf, and the mother goose will love and care for the wolf as if it's one of its own children uh, until the tape recorder runs out of batteries, and then she'll peck it to shreds. Um, ducklings similarly believe the first thing they see when they're born is their mom, and these ducks happen to see a, a dog when they were born, so they'll follow the dog everywhere as if it's their mom. Um, 
And frogs have a simple circuit in their brains. This is fire the tongue whenever you see this, this pixel pattern. So the frog will actually starve itself to death. Um, so, and, and this is the same, same story in, in AI right now where you have these systems that give the appearance of intelligence, intelligent behaviors. Uh, and they're really awesome. They can do all kinds of stuff. They can play Go. Um, they can control robots. Uh, but it has actually the same limitations as uh, the old brain, our old brain an ancestors. Um, and it, it goes wrong. It has the same architecture too, and it goes wrong in, in, in similar ways. So you remember from Max's talk, this uh, example of the, the, the famous deep mind, deep reinforcement learning Atari game player playing a, a brick breaking game. Uh, so if you train it on this game, and you can peel back the layers the same way we do with old brain animals by just asking it to play a game that's the same but only 2% brighter. And this is what it will do instead when it tries to play a game that's 2% brighter. So it's great at giving this illusion of intelligence without actually possessing a rich model of the world in the way you and I think we have one. Um, and the same story is true of DeepMind. My favorite picture of the DeepMind AlphaGo Challenge match is this one because you have to have this human guy sit here and pick up the pieces for it. Because it's actually not playing Go, it's playing computer matrix coloring problem. Because uh, Go actually involves controlling a body. Um, and it isn't to say that deep learning can't control robots. This is uh, work from uh, Google X called the Arm Farm. And uh, this is they're using a deep learning system to, to pick up objects. But to get this system to work, um, I think it was 60% of the time, uh, it took uh, 13 robots running for months straight, uh, doing 800,000 practice grasps uh, in order to pick up objects that are all roughly the same size. And, and when it actually succeeds at picking up, up objects, it doesn't succeed like in, in, a, in a way that you and I would call success. Like, it, it doesn't have a great plan for picking up this object. It happens to work, but not because it has the model of the world. And that's because these deep learning techniques are, are doing something that's kind of akin to fancy regression, for those of you here who have taken a stats class. And, and regression only gets you so far. Uh, so if, you're, if your training set has lots of pictures of cars in it, uh, and your test set has a picture like this, your deep learning system will say, oh, it's a car. But if you show it this image, it'll say it's a bedroom pillow. Um, or uh, these pictures, you know, the, your deep learning system will say it's a bus to train in a cat, but it doesn't actually know anything about buses, trains, and cats. Like, you can keep the pixels that make up the bus, train, and cat the same, and just change the backgrounds, and it'll start thinking it's an amphibian, a snowplow, and a chihuahua. Um, and this is just a property of, of these kinds of fancy regression systems. They learn to generalize really tightly around the training data set, but when you show it something that's outside of it that humans have no problem handling it, it can't handle, and it also generalizes in a bunch of ways that we really don't want it to. Um, so, and these are just properties of, of deep learning. And the most important one, when we talk about building a world full of billions of robots, is you really need to have a model of the world, of where your arms are, where the objects you're interacting with are, and how you're trying to accomplish your long-term goals. And that's something that the deep learning hasn't yet quite cracked. Uh, and it's kind of like the frog. So. Um, I think to move to this world I'd really like to build of billions and billions of, of intelligent robots that are intelligent the way you and I are, we need to shift architectures and explore more that resemble uh, the, the new brain, the, the mammalian neocortex, the human brain. Um, and I'll give you some of my favorite examples of the difference. So um, dolphins and whales in captivity are trained to pick up trash in their tanks and trade it with a trainer for fish. And one day a seagull died and fell into the tank. And instead of getting one fish as a reward, because it was like a big object or something, it got two fish. Uh, and you imagine the frog would just eat both fish, and that would be that. That's not what the whale did. The whale did this with the second fish. And so it repeated that over and over and over again, and it built a stockpile of fish at the bottom of its tank, which it used to train all the other animals how to participate in the seagull for fish economy. Uh, my next favorite example of the difference between the old brain and the new, this is Coco the gorilla. Coco was raised in captivity, and her favorite thing to do, of all things, is watch this American TV show called Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Um, and uh, Mr. Rogers uh, learned that Coco was a fan of his show, and he actually came to visit her in person at the zoo. And the first thing Coco wanted to do with him was help him take off his shoes, because that's how he always started his show. All right, my last favorite example. Uh, of, of mammalian intelligence. This is an 18-month-old child uh, in an environment that's never been trained in before, looking at objects it's never seen before, watching a human it's never met before, do a series of actions it's never seen a human do before, and it's given no instructions after 18 months of being alive. Boom.
Bonjour. So the reason why mammals are able to do these amazing feats is because we have this radically different architecture in our heads. We actually still have the old brain, the reptile brain that's down here. It controls our blood pressure, our immune system and stuff. But on top is this radically different circuit. It's the same circuit across all mammals. And it is, has basically the inverse characteristics of conventional deep learning systems. It's, it takes very little training data. Uh, it generalizes amazingly well to new environments. And most importantly, it learns this model a uh, causal model of the world that we use and animals can use to imagine what if and ask why. Um, and that's the most important part. So instead of having this simple kind of black box end-to-end uh, -end trained system, we have this very rich uh, causal generative model of the world that we can ask dynamic queries of. Um, and we think of the process of building systems like this as, as a process of taking inductive biases, richer inductive biases that evolution may have come to take advantage of, and imbuing them into the kinds of machine learning models that we explore. Uh, there was a great debate I just watched between, between Gary and Jan LeCun um, about nativism uh, in, in AI, and I think that's exactly the right strategy for, for uh, building systems that resemble uh, our minds and the minds of other mammals, and that's the one we've been following at Vicarious for the past many years. So, um, The strength of deep reinforcement learning and why we see it everywhere is that it's so general. You can take uh, a whole lot of data and then you know, put it into one of these deep reinforcement learning systems, and you can get you know, a system that works incredibly well with not that much effort. Um, and that generality is actually also its weakness, because by making stronger assumptions about being in a body and about object permanence and about causality, you can build systems that learn faster and are more robust outside of the training data. And those assumptions in our mind come from physics, from neuro and cognitive sciences, and from math. And I think of them as sort of like general properties of the universe, uh, things like motor regularity, where when you move your shoulders from side to side, the world transforms itself in the same way every time. Uh, and this is, like, this is not an exhaustive list at all, but just to give you an idea of them. Uh, and this is the kind of work we've been doing for a while at Vicarious. Uh, the first thing we uh, set out to do is can we build uh, a, a, a vision system modeled after the human visual cortex that exhibits similar properties, uh, and we showed that we could use it to, to break captures of all things. We actually just today published this in Science. Um, and the thing that makes these, these kinds of systems hard for old brain AI systems is that, that you have to show a ton of different variations of letters in order to get a deep learning system to be able to recognize all of them and to generalize to all of them. Whereas you and I are able to generalize to all these different captures despite probably most of the variations having been things that you're only now seeing for the very first time. Um, now we can take that system and actually a much more advanced version of that system and train it on everyday objects generalize to 3D transformations of the objects, put it inside industrial robots in, in industrial environments, and have it do the kinds of tasks that you see um, humans do every day. And we're able to do this with orders of magnitude, less training data, and with far better generalization than, than other methods. Um, we also applied it to, uh, to motor control tasks, like the, playing these games is us and deep learning both playing the same brick-breaking game. Um, and so you notice in, in, in the first version, the paddle's at the bottom of the screen. That's the training environment. Now, now, what happens when you move the paddle up a little bit, which is analogous to a calibration error in a robot, which happens all the time, uh, we're able to keep right on trucking, whereas the deep learning system has a lot of problems with this kind of variation. Uh, or similarly, uh, if, you, uh, if you look at what happens at the end of one of these games, you never see videos of what happens at the end of the game, and that's because I think it's really embarrassing. It's a, it, this video, I'm not going to make you watch the whole thing because it's 15 minutes long. Uh, and this is actually an average run. This isn't even the worst case. In the worst case, it's hours. Um, because the deep learning system has no notion of paddles or balls or bricks or anything it's actually trying to do, it can't form long-term plans. All it can do is react. And so uh, it just performs this behavior where it kind of bounces the ball around forever uh, and then eventually gets lucky and hits the brick. Whereas when you watch our system and humans play these games, we only move the paddle enough to try and hit the thing that we're trying to hit. Uh, and uh, we do so without missing. Um, uh, another example of this is that we, we took the training environment, we just added a wall to the middle of it. And predictably, the deep learning system just bounces the ball back and forth against the wall, uh, whereas our system, without any additional training, says, oh, I better aim to the left. Um, and so, um, and you can read all, this is a, an ICML publication from a little bit ago. You can read more about it if you like. Um, to put some pressure on its ability to plan and also give you a sense of how it actually works, um, we put it in this environment with lots and lots of moving obstacles. To get any points at all on this one, you like, really have to think carefully about where your paddle is going to be so you can thread the ball between all the different moving walls. Uh, and uh, so I'll show you what's going on inside the mind of the system. Um, so in, in a second, the screen will turn white. And while the screen is white, 
Um, you're seeing inside the mind of the system, and you're watching it imagine all the possible futures it could live in. And then it picks the future where it gets points that it wants to live in, and then it does the motor actions necessary to live in that future. So when the screen's white, the game is actually paused, and you're just watching and imagining the future. It's really kind of hypnotic. Um, and we can also use the same system to solve uh, other long-term planning games. This is a, a Sokoban puzzle. Um, where it needs to, you know, every action you take can potentially put you into a, a state where you can't solve it anymore, and it's the same, same code playing brick breaking as, as one of these strategy puzzle games. Um, so this brings us back to robotics. Um, at Vicarious, we're really interested in making this world where there's more robots than cell phones, and in order to get to that world, we need a different kind of AI. Um, and I, I think that you can actually predict this future um, relatively easily with just two charts. Um, this is what minimum wage has done. Uh, over the past uh, couple of decades, and this is what has happened to the price of a robot. And I actually think this, the, the, the chart on the, the, the right can go a lot lower. Because uh, if you think about a robot today, an industrial robot is, has, has, has design constraints from 1970. Because uh, every industrial robot, you want to be able to move the end effector to within two-tenths of, of a millimeter. And you want to do that for 50,000 hours without recalibrating the robot. And that comes from the automotive industry when robots were first deployed. Um, and that you have to do all of that without a camera, because back in 1975, um, computers weren't fast enough to process signals from cameras. And so uh, all of the hardware engineering in, in robots, it's, it's basically like they're solving problems today with mechanical engineering that should be solved with software. And that's um, the work that we're doing in Vicarious, is to help push that curve even lower. And I actually recently saw uh, some robot arms that were just $8,000 or something, and I, I think we'll, we'll, within the next decade, approach robots that are, are uh, about the price of a cell phone. And I think there's this really interesting parallel between robots right now and computers in 1950. If, if you want a robot today to do something, you go out and you hire a robot integrator who builds you a completely bespoke system just for you. And it's very expensive, and it only ever does that one thing that you wrote in your RFP. And uh, that's exactly the way computers were in 1950. And just like today, there aren't that many robots. In 1950, there weren't that many computers. The future we're heading towards is one where there are a lot of robots everywhere. They are cheap. They're general purpose, and they run software that lets you do whatever you want with them. Um, I see us catalyzing this already ongoing economic chain reaction where as robots get cheaper, more people buy them, and on and on and on, until we end in a world where labor costs as much as electricity. Um, and so uh, humanity's built the whole world we live in, including this room, using two arms, two eyes, and a brain. And I'm excited for robots one day to do the same. Thanks.